Okay, good evening, everyone. Yeah. You're there, man. Good evening. You guys are in. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. everybody. All right, I'll show Welcome to our All Thursday right. night around our Shabbos table. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, wonderful. You can put the video on. So nice. Noodles for everyone. Yeah. Noodles for everybody. We had noodles in the house. I there were noodles in the house tonight. Took a picture of tonight. Noodle night? <laughs> I'm not going to say. <laughs> I have chicken and meatballs cooking. Uh, <laughs> Wait, you didn't serve dinner yet? Shelly's no. making meatballs tomorrow. tomorrow. No, that's for Shabbos. We have cereal and milk for dinner. That's Shabbos in the freezer. Cereal and milk for dinner. <laughs> yeah. We should do like a house swap. We had a we had babka tonight, Rachel. We had babka. We just <laughs> I like babka for dinner. My, my dinner was sponsored by Little Debbie's. <laughs> I like not it. not a joke. That's yeah. better than Little Caesars. <laughs> What's Little Debbie's? Oh my gosh! It's so nice to see everybody around our virtual Shabbos table. I want to call this. I want to have like a subtitle to this class, to this evening gathering around our Shabbos table that this is the virtual around the table and then there's the eventual around the Shabbos table. I still want to like be hopeful and positive and uplifted. And Amen. 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 Oh, I hear Nancy. Rabbi, you know, there are two <laughs> different times for this meeting. Yes, we were, we were told. We're, yeah, we're going to do it at 8 to 9 and then 8.30 to 9.30. Are there still two times? I thought yeah. Only, really? I oh, almost sorry. missed it. So Jen is going to go to the 8.30 session, <laughs> go to the 8 o'clock class, and then we're going to switch. It's going to okay, be Okay, no, pro no problem. We could listen to this all night. <laughs> <laughs> so great to see everybody. What so, is that? A cookie? That's a Little Debbie's. Ah. Uh -huh. That's a Little Debbie's. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> oat, oatmeal cream pie. It's the best. We'll, we'll get them for you. Don't worry. Listen, Uri, at least oh, there's oatmeal. Well. You, can, you should just tell everybody you had oatmeal for dinner. That sounds a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but that sounds healthy. <laughs> it definitely sounds healthy. Healthier, for sure. When I okay. was a kid... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Rabbi. Go ahead. No, no Nancy, no. tell us. Tell us. I was about to say, when I was a kid, my parents were very young when they had us. And my mom would, loved butter pecan ice cream, and she would get a gallon of butter pecan ice cream and put it in the middle of the table with four spoons and called it dinner. And all of my friends were so jealous, except I didn't like butter pecan ice cream. <laughs> First of all, there's, there's the always one. <laughs> for the protein. There's protein. There's calcium. You got like a whole, like a whole nice dinner there. That's what my mother said. <laughs> Okay, amazing to see everybody. Wonderful to have this time together. We look forward to it. <laughs> and uh, we hope your families are safe and healthy and well. I'm just going to start off with um, maybe something, change it up a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, my phone just died. So if anyone wants to add questions, your phone is good. My phone is, is, okay. is not with a lot of battery, but you can actually text us on the chat or uh, you can text my phone. It comes onto my computer or WhatsApp. Any questions, comments, concerns, interests? Additions, we welcome and encourage everybody to participate. So let me throw something out, out here a little bit, a little bit semi-controversial. And I only say it's semi-controversial because I actually did mention it in my Chumash class this morning as way of introduction and way of jump-starting our topic and our learning this morning. And you'd be surprised to know, maybe not surprised to know, that actually, look at those sweet faces, you'd be surprised to know, not surprised to know that I got a number of text messages offline and whatever and otherwise questioning this conversation. So I just want to throw it out here around the Shabbos table. So I'm going to do so by first and foremost, I guess, wishing a mazel tov to the Sharps for the uh, hiring of Tony La Russa, who is the new manager of your Chicago White Sox. Huge <laughs> news, <laughs> massive news. This guy comes out of retirement. You know that his first job as a Major League Baseball manager was with the White Sox. Do you know that? You got to know that, right? I want you to have a number 10 Face mask, <laughs> number seven. Well, is that Bikias or what? Or you're impressed with that, right? Number 10 is Tony La Russa. What do you say, Rabbi Sharp? Chicago has two baseball teams? <laughs> yes, you're, you're <laughs> muted, Rabbi Sharp. Oh my gosh, we got props and all tonight. <laughs> I can't hear you. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. Oh, it's signed by him. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's amazing. So that's, and that's like not in a box. It's like just out for sweating in. We can't hear you. <laughs> you guys are muted again. Don? <laughs> <laughs> I 
So tonight's game is charades. So we're playing charades. <laughs> you guys are up first. <laughs> yes. Yes. That is, yeah. No sauce on the noodles tonight for dinner <laughs> for a thousand. <laughs> okay. In a serious note. So in, in the, in the genre of major league sports. So I threw out today a, what I believe was oh, a major, major public statement. Why? Oh, because you don't want them to say I'm typing. And not only is it a public statement, but it has huge repercussions and ramifications. And I'll just throw it out here as kind of just giving you the event as it took place. I don't need the video. And then we'll throw out there, you know, a little bit of like, what would you do if you were the commissioner of Major League Baseball? This past Tuesday night, the Los Angeles Dodgers ended their 32-year drought and they became world champions. And uh, they were celebrating their world championship at a neutral location, whereas in the past they switch off where they would play, home team, visiting team. They're playing in Texas and uh, they celebrated. But what took place is some of you who are aware, for those of you who are not. Is everybody aware? You might not be. Everyone's aware. Good. The third, their, their prized third, third baseman who was a clubhouse cheerleader of sorts and a main primary personality figure. He tested positive for coronavirus. He was pulled in the middle of the game and he was put in isolation per Major League Baseball protocols. At the end of the game, when they're jumping on each other like a bunch of civilized behemoths and they're celebrating their world championship and they're doing what they're doing, he runs out of the tunnel, joins his teammates and his management managers and coaches, et cetera, and he celebrates with them. And while he came out with a mask, eventually, of course, he took it off, kisses the championship trophy, sits for a picture next to uh, somebody who is a survivor. Um, yeah, good. So who's a survivor of a terrible of an illness, which he was able to survive, but ostensibly puts um, so many people, so many people who are now in self-imposed quarantine, both of those teams at risk. And so the question is, what's the, you know, what's the response to that? Is there public outrage? Is there is there civil? Like, I guess I'll put this in the perspective of like what I would do if I was the commissioner. You know, just the the lawlessness, the the brazenness, the recklessness that happens on national television, that happens uh, of a personality who is, you know, a hero to, ch to children who are beyond, you know, sports fans and idolize sports figures and sports personalities in such a way. And here you have a situation, just to put it into context, is that if you have a, a player, a sports athlete who is on performance enhancing drugs or any type of, you know, uh, illegal substances, so they're punished and they're suspended from Major League Baseball for whatever prolonged period of time. 30 days, 40 days, 60 days, a whole season, whatever it is. And it's in, in essence, what they're doing is they're harming them, themselves. It's a substance abuse policy Major League Baseball has. And I would argue that not only was this person maybe not a okay, detriment to himself, okay, I don't know, but clearly he was a detriment to so many people. And to what extent he doesn't even realize he was a detriment to so many people, notwithstanding the, the chinuch, my words, the lesson that is learned and the and the, the cavalier energy that is exuding from uh, from this reckless behavior. So and I, I know what I would do if I was a commissioner of Major League Baseball. What would you do if you were the commissioner of Major League Baseball? What are your reactions to that? And by the way, this is a safe place. So if you have a reaction that sounds- So even though the rabbi just said yeah, what he yeah, feels. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I should have said that. I should have just like thrown that out of the question. Feel free to disagree. Yes, yeah, I, exactly. It may, maybe, no, I guess that's-, that's Nobody's shy here. Nobody's shy. Be, yeah, share with me the other side. If there's another side. I would suspend it for a year, find the team, and AJ, what do you say? You know, oh, look what? At what are you talking about? <laughs> talk about your cuteness. We're talking about your cuteness. You were just born like five seconds ago. And look how big you are. My goodness gracious! I remember your birth like yes, yes, no. Can I know Such a cutie pie. What do you say, anybody? What do you think? Yes, I would impeach him. Impeach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little hard to hear you through that. Yes, you want. That's to a mixed people? metaphor. Yes, no, it certainly it is. Can somebody pick up the peaches? Linda, you have to unmute yourself. He should be suspended. He put everybody's life in jeopardy and it's selfish. And uh, that's why we have the problem we have today. People not taking care of themselves so that other people are not put in peril. My my question is if, they, if he was waiting for a test result, they all knew that there was a possibility yeah. that something was wrong. So why isn't it all of their responsibility? Good, why, why was he playing to begin with? Right, right. right. So it's not even just him. The whole team like seems like they obviously knew something was coming. Would they get like a call in the middle of the game? It's crazy. Right. That, that's literally what happened, right? 
That's right. what happened. They got a call in the middle of the game and they pulled them. Right. So that's an interesting point. Like who was reckless, who was reckless to even like let the guy play, let alone, okay, you want to be there. You want to be in isolation in some place. Got it. But uh, you know, is it, is it that there's, there's a, is it a greed point? Is it, you know, you got to win a championship. It's a, an elimination game. And then you're going to put your player into the, with the hopes that he's going to be negative. I don't know. And, and frankly, I'll be honest, I, I've seen read like some, some bits of, of pushback about that behavior, but certainly not nearly as much as I would have hoped personally. Anybody? Well, I, I'll, I'll play the devil's advocate because nobody else on this chat will, I'm sure. Um, but will you, you also show your face? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, <laughs> again, okay, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm in New Hampshire. I haven't put on makeup in three months. <laughs> I was joking. I was joking. <laughs> I, I'm sure about to you leave anyway to be the eighth class. You're, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. Fifteen so, more minutes. Let you go. So, if he had the flu, because last year twenty-two thousand people died of the flu, three hundred eighteen thousand people contracted the flu. If he had the flu, would you also feel that he should be? suspended for having the flu because it's all it will also kill you not quite in the same numbers right. but still dead is dead it's less dead more dead still dead right that last point we can't argue with <laughs> <laughs> that point is is a point for sure so so let me let me comment about that because i think i think that there's, there's two points here first of all i am never i have never been and I know there's some 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 of you who he's I would, not the type would, to imagine. send his kids to school Correct. with a cold, right? And I don't like yeah. when mothers and families and fathers do that. I don't think that that's right, no matter what. Even if you have a cold, the flu, a drippy, you know, whatever it is, like people feel that school is what we call rishus harabim, and rishus harabim means okay, so I'm okay with my child having a cold and a flu, and I have to get to the office, and I have responsibilities, which by the way I'm sensitive and empathetic to. But that does not give anybody right to, for a whole host of reasons, whether a person's life is on the line or not. Like, I just don't think ethically, morally, that that is the right thing to do. You have to be respectful of other people's space. And, and unfortunately, I think what's unfolding before our eyes is the difference between low stakes and high stakes. When the stakes aren't so high, so we've acted a certain way because at the end of the day, a cold is a cold. And how many people have you know, traveled with colds and with strep throats and illnesses and things like that. How many people have just interacted with people, so on and so forth? You know, I, I remember, uh, I just remember like years and years ago, there was a whole issue in the show because somebody used to leave his tissues in the cubby area where somebody else was sitting. And this was like a whole thing. Today, there's not even tissues, no seats. It's, not, it's like it wouldn't go. There's a level of that that, that I don't think in general is, is the right thing personally. And I think that part of where people are becoming growingly more uncomfortable is the realization that part of what, you know, whether it's the Northeast or even in the South, where there's going to be common colds and flus and illnesses, nothing to do with coronavirus, they're gonna still have to keep their kids home just because of the suspect and the possibility of it being something else, right? So I'm not a big fan, I'm not a fan of that at all. But I think there's a big difference. And the difference is while you're right, that, that numbers of people died from the flu last year, contracted it and died from it, that every I think year. still, every, every year, year, right? Yeah, I still think, and this could just be like uh, part of the, you know, the debate. The, the debate here, which is a healthy one and a safe one, which is, I, I think that part of what the, the concern is that the jury's still out and it's still so new and still so unknown about the veracity of the coronaviruses. We're still, as much as we have statistics and numbers and, and, and knowledge, there's still so much that's evolving. Like think about what was evolving what took place when March, you know, April and all the, those times what were happening and what was the, the realities. And, and today it seems like there's therapies and treatments and, you know, better results. That doesn't mean that that's better results for everybody, unfortunately, and sadly, but just statistically, it seems that that's the case. That said, obviously, we know, whatever the population is, you know, I think we learned that they predicted it's one population and it's another population and it's this combination of populations and so on and so forth. The bottom line is, is that when we hear all of these variables, what we realize is that people just don't know. And, and I find that, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying that you don't know. I remember when I, for example, I got my smicha. So I, um, the, the Rabbi Zavulun Charlap was the administrator of, uh, of Ritz. So when he was giving me my cloth, which was signed by my Rosh Hashivas and the Rosh Kol, 
he, he said, I'm going to give you the best piece of advice. I'm going to put my phone number on the back of the, of the, of the clock. If you look at the back of my clock, he's got his phone number. So he said, I said, Rebbe, you know, what's that? It's not like it wasn't iPhone days where everybody put their numbers in the iPhone. He said, just remember one thing, that if you don't know the answer to a question, that's like the way of a Ben Torah. That's okay. You can know sometimes that the answer is I don't know. Here's my phone number. If you don't know, you call me. And if I don't know, I'm going to call Rav Shechter. And that's what it is. I don't know. I found it to be like very humbling. Sometimes we just don't know. I, I find that people are pontificating. They're, they're, they're acting as if like they're not only the chief medical examiner, medical director. They're, you know, every possibility of what they know is now authoritative. And I found that the most, you know, the, the doctors that I found the most trust in are the ones that recognize that, that they don't know everything. And when they don't know everything, we have to err on the side of caution and be cautious and be responsible and be respectful. I've been saying this a number of times, you know, I'm giving a Gemara class on Mondays and Shabbos afternoon, which means you cannot stand idly. I'm not going to put Uri on the spot and lane it, but, you know, <laughs> is the idea you can't stand idly and watch your brother's blood be spilled, right? That's this meta principle. But the idea is the Gemara teaches is that one person, one life, is so valuable that call hamatzal nefesh achas it's kilu matzal olamale. Anybody who saves one person is as if you saved an entire world. Anybody who allow, allows one life to be lost is as if you lost an entire world. And what's frightening about that Gemara is that we remember and we re realize, I think, these statements and believe in them. Sadly to say, I think when the stakes are not so high, you know, not when the stakes are really high, I don't know as much. I really think we need to learn how to figure out whether that chazal is something that we believe in. And if the answer is we believe in that, then a player, an athlete, a, 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 an iconic person, and a regular person, and everything in between, have very important responsibilities to model behavior, to act a certain way. And yeah, I agree with you. It's definitely a question. It's certainly another side of the debate, and I appreciate that. I don't know if the world or I would be as, as uh, abrasive about what I feel. It's just a function of the, the, the word pandemic is a serious word and, and the uncertainty of it and the numbers of it and the, and the climb of it. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that w there is something that's biadenu, it seems. I mean, everything's bide shemayim, everything. Everything's bide shemayim, but there is something that's biadenu. I mean, the Rebbe gave us a chance to participate in the refuah to whatever extent that means. Masking and social distancing are not necessarily the answer. If somebody is destined to get it, they're going to get it. However, <laughs> there's certain hishtadlis, which is part and parcel to how we believe things are supposed to go. I so. have something to say, but does anyone else want to comment before I do? I feel like I, Jeffrey, you'd kick I'm him out of the very, league for sure, right? He, he wants to have a chance, this guy. I'm still very sensitive, though, to, like, you have to really put yourself into someone's shoes. And it's this is also, like, a deep question. But, like, if you think about, people decide, you know, what they, what they live for. And you think about what someone would die for. So like these baseball players, this is their whole life. This game is their whole life. And I think that when you see anyone make a decision about like, that could be not good for their health or not good for, but like without it, there's no life. Um, you know, like they, this is the moment he's waiting for his entire life. And to give that up, I think is, is a big, big deal. It's not to be taken so lightly. You know, there's, there's, I know my grandmother who is 96 in LA, she's, she's, um, she wasn't being super careful with Corona. Cause like, she feels like she's older. She wants to be at her children's birthday party her great grandchildren's birthday parties and it's almost like you know what if you're gonna if she's gonna be locked up in a room and she needs to get her hair done I mean she needs to get her hair done she's 96 like she has to so she, you know what what's life without the things that make life life I think that it takes tremendous tremendous inner strength to really value life as just a heartbeat as just you know living it's something to talk about. Oh my gosh, he's so <laughs> not happy with it right now. <laughs> I just think it's still worth talking about. It's just to be sensitive to what people are going through, to decisions that people, how much is at stake to, you know, it, it's it's a lot. I, I'm, I'm for sure. You're not sensitive. I'm for sure. <laughs> I'm for sensitive and empathetic. And by the way, you're Shira, right. Shira, Shira, right. tell yeah. us. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, I'll interject. I'm for, curious. I'll interject for a moment. I haven't, 
aunt who's 80 years old who lives alone in a one bedroom apartment in the Bronx. And for her to not have socialization, she's alone. She, she's never been married. She's alone. She has no children. She, she's not computer literate. She can't Zoom with people. If she ha- did not have socialization, she'd be the, she wouldn't be living at home anymore. She'd be living in, in Bellevue, you know? So as you say, is it just a heartbeat? Like, obviously where there's life, there's hope. So when Corona is no longer and she's 87, then she can go back out and go see her friends. Um, so when I, when I hear about your grandma, your grandmother, I, I'm, I'm very much empathetic of her mindset, but she is also not an island. So though she thinks for herself, well, I'm 97 years old. What's going to happen to me? Um, she also is passing it around. If God forbid she, she gets it. That's the bigger problem. For sure, for sure, being sensitive to the topic. I, I don't think it's, you know, something that is germane or, or easily brushed over. And by the way, this is something that finds itself all over halach and all over conversations of, of matters of significance, you know, end of life issues and quality of life and, you know, who's making those decisions. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it seems as if people are making decisions, you know, some of the, uh, you know, occasions that I've dealt with with certain families, sometimes families just feel that they're overtaxed, overburdened, and therefore they're overburdened, therefore they'll dismiss that process only because of its, you know, of its heavy weight on the people that are the caretakers. And I'm not diminishing that, that's a heavy process. That being said, you know, the conversation, what is quality of life and what is life? You know, as you know, John, as you're describing that, I'm thinking like, it's what he lives for, but then it becomes like what you live for is even more important than life itself. And then it becomes like, right. and we've like lost ourselves a little bit. Like li- right. what, what is totally life? You know, I, and I also wonder like at times it's, there are times that we can decide to hold ourselves back from even our greatest, greatest desires and even our life, what we call our life ambitions and tr- greatest achievements. I, you know, there are lessons for, that are taught. There are achievements that are won. I think there's an achievement even greater than winning the World Series, which is modeling behavior and keeping people safe. And if one person died or was ill or had side effects or has long forevermore uh, realities because of contracting it, because of that cavalier behavior and that reckless behavior. So like, is a World Series championship like is it is it worth it? Like is anything is anything worth it more than life? Like what does life mean? That's the question. And that's the question, of course, and that's so significant where it is. And obviously, as it ties into the parsha, which is every conversation that a rabbi and Rebson discuss ultimately gets to the <laughs> parsha. It, it, it's not. By the way, we're, when we're just talking about ourselves, we talk about the parsha. We when we're he sleep it, talks parsha yeah, too. Right. Yeah. I know what Uri does also, so I have to. So the answer is that lech lecha, the key word there that is, of course, to the commentaries and the commentators' curiosity is just lech. Just Leave, go. go. You should go. What's the lecha? The lecha is like, all right, there's so much. There's the promise Rashi says that he's going to grow prosperous and, and be enumerated and he's going to have descendants. The lecha is like the, is the challenge of this whole, of the parsha. Lech makes sense. Lech. Lecha, what's lecha? To you. To you. So some of the Bali Musar understand what the lecha is. If you look in the Nesiv Shalom, what the lecha is, is go find yourself and think about what the value of life is. You know, not just your birthplace, not just your homeland, your father's home and everything that it represents and the legacy and your connection and the narrative and your descendants. I mean, it's like, a, it's like very, very heavy. So the quality of life and the caricature of what life is supposed to be, that's so significant to think about what is the quality of life and the fact that we feel fatigue and everybody feels fatigue everybody feels fatigue the fact that you feel fatigue is something to be you know considerate of and considerate you know it could be cons- to be measured by what decisions we make for sure it goes without saying and i don't underestimate that challenge it is and we have to do whatever we can to keep saying and go out and do it safely and interact with the world the right way and the way we we're supposed to Yes, so there is, I be, I'm just a, you can have your cake and eat it too type of person. And I just think it has to be done responsibly, not recklessly. There is a selfishness and there has to be a selflessness. What would just be if even though he forgave and gave up his own personal ability to be jubilant and take a picture and to kiss the trophy, 
Say, so kiss the trophy in two weeks. There's lots of people that have to kiss the, what, whatever the proverbial, you know, trophy. you know, trophy is in our lives that you can kiss a little bit later. So you kiss a little bit later because you have, you, you, because there's something called life that's more important than the ambitions that you've spent your whole life committing to. That's okay. my pushback. Not, that, sorry. I think more important even than the life issue, and I'm going to throw my two cents, forget anything else, young people, the youth, the kids, look up to these athletes like they are, you know, the end all. And the problem which they tend to forget, and I'm going to, you know, and, and, and any of the leaders, any of the people that people look up to, set an example. And what he he did today to the young people who were watching him is he set an example that I don't think is a great example that my personal needs, my personal emotions, my personal desires supersedes everything else. And I agree with you, but we don't know. And the experts don't know. And I, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time talking to Rabbi Dr. Avram Steinberg when I was in Eretz Yisrael. And you sit and you talk and he says, he says, we don't know. They don't know. Now, to err on the side of caution, I think, is a logical and responsible thing to do. So what he did today may have no implications other than the fact that it's taught, it's shown the young people, you know what rules are there, but you don't have to follow it. If you have a desire, do it and forget about the implications to anybody and everybody else. And the problem is we live in a very much so me first society where people tend to care about them care about themselves and you know i think as jews and especially as observant jews you have to care about your fellow man i think first and foremost and i think above anything else and you rabbi you and i've had this discussion and i've said to you many times there's two sides to the the right side and the left side and I firmly believe that we need to put a lot more attention on the left side than we're currently putting. And what he said today was a very bad example. Yeah. Is there such a thing? I appreciate your, your comments very, very much. Is there such a thing? I had a conversation with somebody today who actually was wondering, is there such a thing called being too cautious? Can you be too cautious? I'll tell you kind of what the conversation that will ensue with some of my children at some point. And it's ensued with my children this topic, but just a different, just different characters. And the answer is like, what happens if nobody contracts COVID-19? And, and at the end of the day, really there's rules. So it's the, it's rules for rules sake. We all know that people drive past the drive that, you know, the speed limit every single day, people don't, you know, yield at a yellow people don't stop fully to stop. The, 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 the law giver and the law followers, there's a big divide. You know, there's only a few and far between really. So I guess the question then will be is like, what would happen? You know, you had that big Shabbaton and really they shouldn't have had it and they weren't wearing masks, they weren't social distancing and then nobody got it. And what happens if nobody gets it? So maybe uh, th there is a, a, a very strong voice that's saying that, you know, there's so much angst and, and un unconditioned worry and people got to get back to their worlds and their lives. And God forbid, Khalil of do we wish anybody to get sick there? But is it that it's, it's a story that if they get sick, oh, look what happened. You see, you have to be careful. But if they don't get sick, so maybe there's some people that are emboldened by the fact that if nobody gets it, nobody contracts it at some point, that they don't, they don't contract it. So maybe what he did is he was just a little bit courageous and he like in the face of the pandemic and you'll stand up tall and you'll, you know what, it, don't be scared people. It's, it's flu like, I mean, so Rabbi, you're, you're driving at three o'clock in the morning. There isn't a car anywhere to be seen. You come up to a red light. Do you wait until the light turns green or do you go through the red light? There's nobody there. No police, no other cars, no pedestrians, nobody. Or do you wait? Wait. Exactly. You wait. You wait. 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 I don't know if most people. <laughs> what? I was saying that's a great example that people should think about because we do know a lot. Everybody says we don't know. They call it a pandemic for a reason. It's a right. pandemic because it's highly contagious. Now, you may get it but different people have different experiences with getting it. Some people have it lightly and recover quickly, but if you're elderly, 
they say it's worse, but it's not always worse. There are elderly people who get it who just stay at home and nothing happens. And I think the risk is also that we don't think about sometimes is what happens if we decide, all right, so we won't be quite as careful as we were before. If you get sick, somebody has to take care of you. And you're putting that responsibility on the people who mean the most to you. And maybe they can't even come in because they don't want to be exposed to the virus. So you set up a whole train of questions that you should be asking yourself before you're willing to take that chance. Yeah, it's so well articulated and I so appreciate that point. I, I think that also boils down to like how people live their lives. Like, you know, the, the, Mishnah, the Mishnah describes a person who is a roa es hanolad as one of the primary, a at, es yeah, it's one, a person who sees and anticipates the future. Right, the students of Rabbi Shimon Ben, uh, Rabbi, um, Yochanan ben Zakkai, when extolling the praise of them, so Rabbi Shimon um, was one who said that to be a roas anolad. Roas anolad means you anticipate, you can predict, you can forecast, you can bavarn, as they say in Yiddish. You can look and see what's going to be. There, there's, there's a reason why that had to be taught to the people because there's, there's a little bit like, you know. Um, let live and you'll, you'll, you'll eat now and you'll be married today and you'll just not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is something that I don't have to worry about. You know, the, the famous saying, what do I have to, what do I have to worry about tomorrow? But that's not a Jewish concept. We plan, we strategize, we condition ourselves, we wonder about consequences. We're supposed to think of the concept of which means that which is gained is offset by that which is lost. It's true, you'll gain something. You'll be able to interact and be able to do whatever you want to do, but there's something that's lost. So this is the algorithm that everyone's contemplating and struggling with. Like what is the algorithm that works to go out a little bit, to do more, to do less? And the consequences, Barbara, like you just said so eloquently, is that there is a chain and there are other people. And then there's a reality. You know, I somebody confided to me privately that they're just worried that if they contract it, they're not worried about they're not worried, exactly what you said. They're not worried about them, their own health, actually. I don't know why, but they're not worried about their own health. But they're worried that they're going to be alone because no one's going to be able to easily access right. them. Or even if they're not, they're going to be alone, but they're going to possibly put at risk other people. Listen, I have a, a brother who's a doctor, who's a physician, who's been working in the hospitals in New York you know, since this whole thing started. And it's very personal for me. And I'm sure it's personal for you who have either friends or families that are on the front lines. And every single time my brother puts on like his multi-layer gear and his masks and his shield and his, you know, footies and woodies and all the things that he's doing, like so, and, and he's isolated from his wife and from my, my nephews and my nieces and he's got to like live in a different location. Like, so obviously I'm, I'm like ch cheering him and, and celebrating him and, and being mechazing him. I'm so proud of him, it's unbelievable. But I'm also like nervous because it's my brother. I don't want him to be exposed and, and he's been exposed. And how many COVID-19 tests has he had since March? He's had, I weekly. mean, let me, what's, what's weekly over seven months? I mean, you're talking about like abnormal amounts and they're not comfortable. They're not, they're not comfortable. <laughs> when, I mean, I had one COVID test, thankfully it was negative. And goodness gracious, it's scarring. Israel came out with the mouthwash one. <laughs> uh, did they? Leave they did. They came out with a of, of where you spit. That they have a mouthwash kind of thing, and then you Amazing spit into thing. a cup, and then they they can. I think it's like a fifteen minute test. I'm looking that's forward amazing. to that for the airport. Maybe that will open up the airport. Wow, that's that, amazing. That's great. That's great. Yeah, but but it's not comfortable. And here you have people that are putting right. themselves it's not. at risk, and they're they're on the front lines, and they're doing. And they, these are these are serious heroes. These are serious people that you know. I was talking to a physician, like when they were going to medical school, there was a theology, there was a, there was a desire. But like when that is put to the test, when the rubber hits the road, and like you now, like what you signed up for, you got to like live it and do it. Different ball game, different ball game. It's like in any career, in anybody's business, you know, there's what I thought the rabbinate was before I started the rabbinate. I mean, I knew there were other things. What the, I thought the rabbinate was just a lot of like fiery speeches and lots of, you know, bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs and everything was like, you know, a lot of dancing, a lot of labor dicking. And oh my goodness gracious, like that's like a small part of it. I mean, it's, it's the bread and butter part of it, obviously, but there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. When I went to graduate school to get a master's in clinical psychology, my grandma, my father said to me, Trust me, you're going to need this for your field. I'm like, that is two different businesses. <laughs> and you need it. Yeah, you know, you need it. <laughs> you need it. 
He's dealing with people. That's what it is. Chef Mayor, what do you say? What do you think? Your your opinion on this matter? Why is that? You're on, uh, you're on, you're muted, dear, dear chef. You're muted. Maybe what is related to the discussion here or not, just I have a, a feeling about some what is maybe related. I talk about the, 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 the principal, principal Larson from uh, the from Spanish the River Spanish River High School. I don't, we don't have the problem with him so far, but we have the problem with the whole board there. He said he doesn't acknowledge the Holocaust. It's not a fact. That is not a fact. And why is the board making a whole meeting and holding a meeting and calling for the Holocaust where people should come, excuse me, that we should come testify against him? No, I don't go against him. I go against the board. They are the educated, they are the educator, and they did, don't know that the Holocaust was there. Right. They know that the Holocaust was and everything. So how can they not fire him right away? Just they making a halt, they give him another chance but, uh, that he should come now apologizing. Yeah. yeah. Fine. The, very well said. It's a very hot topic. And, so and what, right. what are our people, why they don't call in that, that they, the whole board should be fired? Because yeah. they are the anti-Semites. Yeah. A number of us have been petitioning and calling and actually spoke to some of the board members. And it was very fiery when we spoke to them. Similarly, same ideas. Like, what are you giving audience to this? And what, what is this conversation? There's a concept called being guilty by accomplice. You know, you're, you're guilty by your compliance. There's only so much innocence you can plead. It's like, uh, you know, Mayor, you and I have spoken about this so much. Like the, the people who are on the peripheral, the ones who were the, the Poles, the Germans, the Austrians, those who were like the civilians. How are you a civilian when you see what's happening? You know, you're a Buchenwald survivor and a hero in my eyes and our eyes. Like you told me so many times where you had encounters with those who quote civilians. Like to hold people responsible is, is certainly, you know, uh, what we believe in. And I would even say that it's <laughs> Rabbi, Rabbi Riskin wrote an amazing article a number of years ago. They got to unearth it because uh, I got to find it's very important to this conversation. I could send it to you. He spoke about just th the people in the pews. And the example he gave was the Beacon Theater on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Basically, the idea that, that who shushes the crowd when somebody speaks? Is it the usher or is it the people? The people are intolerant. It's not, it's like in the shul, it's not just the rabbi that has to shush the people. It's the people have to shush the people. It's the people have to be intolerant of bad behavior. And, and I guess it's, that, that's the, what's been bifurcated is the, it's the, it's the lawgivers. It's the people that are the rule setters and the trend setters. And then there's everybody else. I totally agree with you. The board is anybody who's giving audience to even this conversation, they're outrageous. It's, it, it's the voice okay. that we, have, have pushed and, and been trumpeting in our conversations with some of those elected officials and members of that board. You know, it's, it, you're hundred percent right. There, there shouldn't be a hearing is basically what you're saying. And, and it's very related to what we're talking about, I think, because I think that the topic is that people don't want to face the truth when it's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's all calm, and, all calm that, no, that he is a principal and the board also, they don't, they did, they knew what happened in Parkland, how many children were killed there by the shooting, right? They knew how many kids were in uh, Arizona, what were killed also by the violence that they know about this, right? They know that four, 545 children from the, uh, 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 no, from the immigrants are missing. And we don't know to this day what happened to them. I can give you the answer what happened to them because it happened to us that they took away the children from the mothers. They took away the children to, from, from everything and they, they took him as a guinea pig to study medicine. They took off the skin from the people and they did all kind of uh, thing and that's what they're making with the 400, 545 children here too. Yeah. Nobody says nothing about that. Nobody yeah. should know that. The, these so are these said, now Monday, this Monday, 
is the board is sitting about this uh, principle, they should not even say not one word to say, hey, you fired and you finished done with you. That, that would be a very powerful lesson. And that, what, what you're saying, and, and in the baseball analogy, right? Obviously, it's, you, you can't compare. It's apples and oranges. But the idea of it's not just the guy. It's to Jen's point at the beginning, which is like, didn't they all know that he was testing? Like the, the idea when somebody's on, uh, testing and waiting results back, like everybody should have been on board. And the fact is that they're all held responsible and shame on them all and shame on the board and shame on the teams and shame on major league baseball and shame on anybody who allows it to happen. I totally agree with you. It's, it's a, it's, it's sadly, I'm going to say it like it's, it's, I'll tell you what I'm thinking as you're talking, it's the visceral reminder the visceral reminder that we're, we're in Gullis, we're in terrible Gullis. Things are so, we're in exile. We're, we're in absolute cr- exile of, of, the, of a crushing kind. And that we, in our comforts over so many years, maybe we've forgotten, but we are in an exile, which is a, a, a pain that we're feeling that is a confusion, that's a chaos of unprecedented measures where the where, where the outrageous has become ordinary and commonplace, where the unforgivable has become the re- the normal, and unfortunately, part of what you know, good Samaritans and and normal free thinking people and God fearing people and people who live with the moon and bitachon and people who've seen Gehenna, hell, and and worse, and have thrived and survived like yourself. So those people are like, where's the voice of morality? Where's the voice of reason? Where's the voice of of, of normalcy, like we're just craving normalcy. That's the word we keep hearing over and again. Like, where is the normalcy? We just Maybe talk about it. Doing. What are we doing to like I will, make I will it I Monday, nine o'clock in the morning. To the board. For the board. They're giving him one minute. They're giving me only one minute to talk. <laughs> on, uh, on Zoom? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Only one minute I have to, to answer their questions. What can I answer in one minute? I'll tell, I'll tell you. I mean, obviously what you can do one I, minute. I know what to answer them. I said, in one minute, I can tell you one thing that you all fired. <laughs> I'll tell you what you should do while you're talking. Who am I to give you advice? I'm just a simple little guy. But while you're talking, just put your arm up there and show them the numbers that are that are forever more for the rest of your life and blaze that, that he was going to do anyway i have going to do anyway you have a conversation with them like this and by the way as you're telling them let them let them let them realize that, that those are numbers that don't belong in your skin that you have nightmares about every single that's night. right and 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 then tell them the board and him this principle which is what a number of the rabbanim a number of people have done what we were saying is that here's what we're going to do is that we are going to we're going to in fact, there's a, a number of people that are offered with just generosity, is that, um, yeah, we, I won't go. It, which is, um, to, that's, come on, China, don't trip on that wire. Um, that they're offering to, to have a mission to Auschwitz with him and the board. That's where they need to go. They need to go see Majdanek. They need to go see Auschwitz Birkenau. And the thing is that he's now saying he's apologizing. And how, yes, why is he apologizing for something he didn't do? His <laughs> claim was he didn't do it. And now all of a sudden he's going to apologize for it. Right. That's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation, which I agree. It's like, you know, apologies, you know, all the Rabboni Shalom wants from us, all God wants from us is sincere apologies. Not like apologies when you're like dangling off a cliff and like your, your livelihood, your everything is, you know, um, then the apology is like a little bit of a different story. I catch that. Rabbi, I, I don't know the last time you were in Auschwitz Birkenau or in Majdanek, but I will tell you, even what's going on there today is very, very troubling. In Majdanek, there is almost, I couldn't find one indication when I was last there that a Jew ever set foot in Majdanek. Nothing. And when I went into Auschwitz, with the march and they forced us to have a Auschwitz guide to take us around. And the Auschwitz guide explained how 6 million Poles died in the Holocaust. And they're right, 6 million Poles did die. But unfortunately now what they're doing indirectly is they're mixing up 6 million Poles, 6 million Jews. And I will tell you that it's slowly but surely, I think being diluted and I think the impact is being 
lesson and I think may, you need like what Mayer's saying is correct. I don't think people really comprehend what happened. What you do see when you, you still walk through, not so much Auschwitz, but through Birkenau, you still will find bones on the ground. But again, people go in there and it's, it's much more sterile than it was back then. The buildings in Birkenau for the most part aren't there. It's clean. You go there in the summer. It's a sunny day. Try to imagine walking there in the middle of winter in the freezing cold with nothing on. It's very different. And uh, taking a guy like that, yeah, I'd love to take him in the middle of winter, have him walk the death march that the prisoners of Auschwitz walked, and then see how he feels at the end of the day, wearing what they wore. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say I would say that I, I agree with you, but here's what I would add. Here's, here's what I would add. I would add this. And this is to me where I can put my head on my pillow at night and I can rest and I can feel peaceful and I can feel optimistic when I wake up in the morning. And that's the bottom line, which is what I'm going to share with you now, which is that even though all of this is true, look how beautiful and strong Eretz Yisrael is. It has its issues. It has its machlokas. It has its yeah, factions and fractions. We have Eretz Yisrael. We have Yerushalayim and Kodesh. We have Torah that's thriving around the world. We have, look at our Boca Raton Jewish community that has exploded. I'm not talking about just even our shul community. That's obvious. But, but our Boca Raton community, this Torah that's thriving. There, there's, I mean, look, you can go to places. I don't know. I see that the Abramsons are here with us tonight. You go to places that are desert that are barren, that there's no water, that there's no habitation, and then they're growing as srogim, and there's date trees, and there's people that are living there, there's vitality and vibrancy, and there's growth, and it's extraordinary, and it's so unbelievable, by the way. And chicken and way. eggs. What? And chicken coops and eggs. <laughs> you're just trying to hit it. You're trying to get to the to, to the, the to, 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 to the kishkas. That's right. <laughs> Chicken poops and eggs and eggs for everybody. Everyone should eat eggs. Lots and lots of of eggs. But the answer is is that look. That to me is the greatest finger wag against this whole thing. There are injustices and there are inappropriate behaviors, so on and so forth. But look how strong. Look how vibrant. We are an amkishe oref, both in the negative sense. And we're an Amkishe Oref in the positive sense. We will not back down. The, the you know, Israeli Defense Forces is strong. The, the Siata Dishmaya that we're, we should be Zochet to is continually strong. The Torah learning that's going on, it's Givaldic. People are limited to their ability to sit face to face with people, and there's Zoom learning, and there's more Zoom learning, and there's this year, and there's that year, and there's this growth, and there's this Ruchnius. I don't know. I, I look at those things and I feel super positive, not just because there's new restaurants in Boca Raton. That's also exciting when that'll be available. For us. I'm talking about when, look at the vibrancy. Look at the for, vibrancy. For, for Rabbi, that's really this year. I'm sorry. Yes, Linda. Sorry. Rabbi, this, this, but you're coming from a different place. You're coming from education and knowing, and you can see the growth. You take somebody who has no background and they're not going to see it. They're non-believers and they're not going to see it. Linda, you hit the nail on the head. You know, what, what, what Jerry didn't mention, I think he knows, the land that he was talking about down in Chalutza years ago, and they were talking about exchanges of land with the Palestinians, that land was offered to them. And Arafat said basically, like, who wants this? What's going to grow here? And take a look what Jews with vision and a positive attitude can do. That's right. But that's because they have the background and they know about it. But you take a non-believer and somebody who thinks this whole thing is hogwash and there's no way you're going to convince them. Right. So uh, Rabbi, to answer your question. Oh, go ahead. Yes, yes, dear Uri. Take me off mute me. To answer your question. The punishment should be if I were Major League Baseball commissioner. The, the Los Angeles Dodgers clearly should have their World Series title revoked. It should, <laughs> it should be given to the last team that they lost to in a World Series 
Which would be 2018 to your Boston Red Sox. <laughs> v'chule, v'chule. Yay. And now we have an answer. And I was, I'm glad I entertained everyone. And I think that that would be, I think that would be the only appropriate response here. And I feel only like Ori Yudowitz could do this. You're the best, Ori. You're the best. I'm Obvious. here for you. I aim to please. <laughs> Something tells me you got Chaim Bloom on the other line and you got some conspiracy going on. Is that I, heard, I heard he might be on another popular book of uh, uh, Facebook podcast something coming up in the next couple of weeks. We'll see if we can, we'll see if we can book him here. I love it. I love it. So Rabbi, yeah, Rabbi, yeah. in the words of Mr. Rogers, look for it in the tough times. In the words of Mr. Rogers. He said his mother told him when he was a boy and things would be terrible. There would be tragedies to look for the helpers. So each of us, Linda, each of us have to stop being living in this dark place and look for the helpers. Be a teacher. Do something to do something kind for somebody else now. Don't get into a dark pay place. You get on the phone, Mr. Rappaport, and you call that school board and you show them your numbers and you volunteer to do a Zoom class for that person who was the Holocaust denier. You be a helper and you teach him. You say, I want his, not only his, his, his apology, but that he has to go through a full training program and I will be his personal teacher. You empower yourself and lose your anger. That will change it for you. You will become a helper and a teacher. He's got to be out of the system. He's got to be out of the system. Listen to me. Listen to me. Look That's for the help. Change the mind. I disagree. Be positive, Linda. Positive, my dear. Be positive. Make it's change not it. Work. This guy's been sitting for three years positive. in the corporate office. And I'm not going to be negative with you, Linda. I'm only okay, going to be positive. Fine. I'm going to look for solutions, not problems. Sarah Imenu. Sarah Imenu. I need to disagree. I'll be going to be a 30 class. I'll be going to be a 30 class. <laughs> there, you, you can teach that hard class. Hard teach them what it is to go through the Holocaust. Rabbi, you got the right degree in college, your master's. <laughs> I'm going to start my PhD course in five minutes. I'm, I'm going to be at the Harvard PhD course. Hey, mayor wants to yes, dear mayor, yes. I want to enter on that. That is not only this. This is it. Altishkach Mashe Amalik Asalecha. Don't forget what the Amalik did to us. What are all our people? Instead to go demonstrating for some nonsense, why they don't come and demonstrate here against the whole board that they should be fired with, with the principal together. Why they don't come out there the Monday, nine o'clock and if they demonstrate there. That's what hurts me. What are our people? They forgot about this? So I think I think that that I is that come down. No, I cannot come down because I am the, the survivor. I know what happened. I think Shelley's saying that you should use your passion and be robustly strong like like ever before. Um, but realize that your power of your voice and your strength, which is stronger than anybody we know, has a power that that nobody else has. You're right that everybody needs to share that voice. I agree with that. And we got to all be there together. I think that we, with you is in that lead, because nobody could speak like a survivor can. Nobody, nobody can. And, and nobody denies that at all. And, and your pain one is- minute, I cannot answer in one minute. What can I say in one minute? My name, and I am opposing the <laughs> you are opposing. That's all, yeah. you and him together. I have a it's suggestion a for you, for your one minute. How about if we suggested that he could stay on if only he not only goes through a course, but he has to write the curriculum. He cannot come back on until he writes a Holocaust curriculum for the whole school system. Mm -hmm. In other words, he really will have to believe what he's writing mm -hmm. and that the committee who looks at it isn't this board. There has to be a board of, of people outside of this board who have to approve this Holocaust. And you would be one of the people on there who would be approving the Holocaust education. Mayor, I love the rabbi's suggestion. And I still think that'll be the most powerful message and that'll take seconds. Your arm with the number, the way they tattooed 
people like he tattooed animals. I want to see how he's going to react when you go like this and that number appears there that's with you for the rest of your life and has been with you since the Holocaust. I, I, would, I would just add to that. That for sure is going to be the most powerful, no question. But I'll tell you what's, what's sometimes even more powerful to me, from a, a more powerful optic for me that I actually think about almost every single day is not only do I see mayor's numbers, but I see when he wraps his tefillin on top of those numbers every day. That vision is, is like embedded in me. That's like, there is nobody and it's there is embedded nothing. in him. It's embedded in Chaim. It's embedded in Shimshi. It's embedded in all the children in our shul that they come oh. on Yom HaShoah and they hear your story. It's embedded into their souls. Right. But that idea of, of, of the numbers, he has to see them. And that we wrap our tefillin on and that we could have I had an esrog this year from Chalutza. It was the best esrog in the history of Israel. I, I don't think I've ever, I don't, I'm serious. I don't think I had an esrog as nice. It was from a place that there is no, there's, it's just desert. And it was like just this spectacular esrog that I used this year in a place that Be'eretz Lo Zarua and in a land that was flowing with milk and honey and is flowing with milk and honey. It's the yin and the yang. And it's a hot conversation. And these are meaningful debates and meaningful thoughts. And in uh, the safe place that like this around our Shabbos table, the only thing missing here, only thing missing here is a little bit of kugel, a little bit of auction kugel, a little bit of cholent, a little hummus, a little someone in the splash zone, right, Linda? A little right. splash zone. <laughs> that splash zone will forever be Irving's of blessed memory. Some little and, Debbies. Some little Debbies, yes. <laughs> we need to, <laughs> Uri, it looks like you're going for dessert now. So yeah. maybe some, uh, some cookish cake, uh, but but I appreciate the conversation, and of course it's robust, and of course there's so so much more to say and so much to, more to share, but it's the passion and it's the enthusiasm and it's the energy and it's the positivity and it's the seriousness and the value of life. Yeah, that we debate and that we value and that we commit ourselves to and that we are ever ever so mindful of now and please God, always and forever. Amazing. This is more rigorous and fun and meaningful. Uh, and very meaningful evening together. So I and think we are all with you, Mayor, Monday morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. For sure. We, lo we listen and we love you and you mean the world to us. Thank you. So wow, look at Uri. Do you see what, what Dr. Mark Brandris has done for the occasion this evening? That is like real <laughs> love. And, and the Sharps aren't happy about this. They're going to get their Carlton Fisk shirt off of... Uh, you know, Surly's bed and wherever that is. And I, look at that. Celebrating Mark. the rightful champion. <laughs> yes. Mark, did you just go to Lids at the mall and buy one of those? <laughs> <laughs> did you just go to Lids? Uri, did you just like go to his house and drop off a Boston Red Sox? Oh, what's going on, Barbara? I mean, what's happening? Any, yeah, any time I went off video, it was I was going to the Brandresses. What, no, what happened is, you know, I was born in Wisconsin. I used to have a Milwaukee's Brewer hat knew who I was, Mark Brandris, but Milwaukee Brewers changed their logo. All right. That's right. I had to get a Red Sox hat. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not really a Red Sox, you're, you're, you're Team Brandris. Are you, are you buying that or no? I don't feel like that's... I think his Borsalino is better actually, but I like this one too. <laughs> You can wear a Borsalino for Brandris also. Okay, you're busted. This shop is you got to wear a Borsalino. I love it. Hey, Brandris, a word you're watching to the senator guy? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our Shabbos table. We hope that you'll see you again That's next so week. Yeah. We miss you all and we love seeing your beautiful faces. Have a beautiful Shabbos. Thank you. Have Thank a great Shabbos. Miss you. Have a beautiful uh, Shabbos. Love to all of you. Thank you, Shabbos. And Rabbi, I've never been anyone that in birth.